Welcome to the Lesbo and the Bean universe. Lesbo and the Bean. L-A-T-B. Lat B. Where mixed martial arts and the UFC get silly. Big silly. Buckle up and move your tray tables to their upright position. And please, somebody shut that baby up. It's time for Lesbo and the Bean. Welcome back. Welcome back. What a great fan expo. It, this weekend was just everything we could ask for, plus more, a whole lot more. I mean, we almost brought you guys a, a breakdown of weigh-ins just because of Max Holloway falling out of the co-main event due to concussion-like symptoms. There was also a bad spill taken by Daniel Cormier prior to their fight on the pay-per-view, but that's jumping the shark. We got a long way to go before we get there. Real quick, how was your Friday night finale card well you're right to kind of go into the max holloway stuff before we've been talking about the friday card welcome back to lesbo and the bean what a weekend of fights every time i think i'm like oh i'm so excited for friday and saturday night fights i'm so excited but then by the time they get here my heart can't handle it my heart can't ever handle it Oh, I'm almost glad some of the stuff fall, fell out. Maybe my heart couldn't really? handle the truth. Really? I'm not at all. I wanted to see that Ortega fight. I would say as much, if not more, than DC Miocic was historical. It was we don't an amazing have, we fight. We shouldn't even talk about that. We shouldn't go that far ahead. So, right. Max looked a little green-gray. Everyone's giving kind of a little bit of credit to Bisping for calling it out. And his he got pulled out at first. It was concussive-like symptoms. I've heard other stuff saying that it could have been weight issues. Have you heard anything? I haven't heard the weight issues at all, but I did hear and see where Michael Bisping was calling out. And here in the Lap B Lounge, we were talking off camera about like, whoa, this, was he seeming like he had just like woken up out of bed? Bisping said exactly that, or he was just kind of a little dopey and just like yeah you should i don't know he just seemed for his the sharpness that we know of max holloway he did seem a little bogged down i thought he was jet lagged personally mm -hmm. i verbalized is he jet lagged right there was a Something's noticeable up. something and uh my wife actually was like um maybe uh the cbd is a little more lenient in the states and he just got off the plane and was like anti-inflammatory cbd Look at how I put that all in good terms instead of making it like something illegal. Something medicinal that he was using. But then now. after it all came out that something could have been wrong, the color of his skin was so off. It, ma it makes me worried. I don't know if we'll see Max at 145 again. I think it's a bigger deal than just missing this fight. Something's up. They're all big dudes. And if it's concussive, like they're also saying... That could be that we never see him fight again, not just that, not 145. If right. it's something mental that made that go down with him after flying, because that's what I also had to look up a whole bunch of stuff of, if you get on a plane, can the pressure um, change, make something happen in your head if you were concussive already and didn't take any kind of action toward it? And yeah, it yeah. can have a lot to do with it. I that so. They specifically tell you that if you scuba dive, you don't go oh, fly the same huh. day. Yeah, it's too much up and too much down. Yeah, you'll pass out because they, it is too much of a level change. For so the I really, mind. really, really, I had a moment. I sat and thought, if I never get to see Max Holloway fight again, I cannot have that. He is one of my top three favorite fighters. Me personally, I love Max Holloway. I hope he gets well soon. I have to see him fight again. I have to see him fight Brian Ortega. Oh, that's going to happen. Yeah. Brian Ortega was offered Jeremy Stevens, and Ortega turned that down, and rightly so. We've seen a lot of other guys, a la Frankie Edgar versus Brian Ortega, where Frankie was about to fight Max. That card fell out, and Frankie was like, okay, I'll just fight Ortega and then fight Max. Well, guess what? Frankie's now at the back of the line because he just got knocked out, so Ortega didn't take that. He said, nah. I'll fight Jeremy Stevens with a full fight camp. Well, I'll wait for you, champ. I'll wait. I think it was the smartest call as far, and a lot of other guys should take 
no to that. Well, being the smartest contenders. part about it is, like you're saying, you go to the back of the line, there is nothing to gain by losing to Jeremy Stevens, and there's nothing to gain for Brian Ortega at this point to winning to Jeremy Stevens. Exactly. You, if he already is the guy, there was enough hype. Everyone wanted to see Brian versus Max. I think he just sits back, patient. He likes his camp. He likes what he's doing. I don't know. I don't know what to be said about it. I have to find out what is going on with Max before I put my judgment somewhere. Totally. So before even Max and Ortega ever even mattered, we had a whole fight night finale that went underway. And in those weigh-ins, there was a bit of controversy. Uh, People were iffy on... Did everybody make way for that? Or was there somebody who completely shot the bed there? But the most notable thing about the weigh-ins that we saw this entire expo weekend in Vegas was for the main event, there was alternates that had weighed in. And this kind of precludes or preludes to the Kevin Gastelum situation that happened about a week or two ago where Gastelum was supposed to be the alternate and Dana White was really mad that Gastelum wasn't ready to make weight. And Gastelum was like, cool, I'll make the weight. You just got to pay me. You just got The UFC apparently didn't want to compensate him to whatever he felt was justified. So uh, I love that the UFC is putting in backup so that we don't have these main events fall out in those weight classes. But at the same time, I do not like that the UFC is just keeping somebody on call because if you have to cut to make weight, it's not just, hey, I'm going to wake up and fight. And it's one of those things where it's like, do you train for two months for one guy to fall out? How do you really do that? Do you train for them both? Or are you just... There's a lot of... I like that they're being proactive, the UFC, in this. But I also see that there's a lot of hiccups that are going to come along the way that is inevitable. Did you end up noticing that? Did it scare you? I thought my Tavares bet was in the air for a little while because when I initially looked it up, people were saying that Tavares had a prior injury coming out of Hawaii. Yancey Medeiros also dropping his bout and Max Holloway. Now I was like... Well, he's out of Vegas, but I don't know. I remember Brad Tavares having bad knees. I you stuck think with him. They all fell out because there's too much sulfur in the air from the volcano still erupting. You think they're all breathing in some nasty ash? The only reason I can't I, that can happen to those guys, but Brad Tavares is a late, late is a Las Vegas local boy oh. and has been for over like five or seven really years just, now. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, huh, what could they all have in common that's going on right now? Making something out of nothing. You know how I like to do, make something out of nothing. So, with the Friday card, we're not going to go super heavy, heavy deep into it, though. There was a lot of upsets. It was a upset heavy weekend, making money where we could, but one that I didn't see coming was Mershart over Pichota, or Picota, Picota gassed in the first round after he tried to get that rear naked choke and then at the end of the first mere shark turned it around second he was ragdolling Pachota around one of the biggest comebacks of the year I mean it was a 10-8 round that first round against mere shark and then gas city do you remember much of that fight it was early on in the week yeah I remember it I was bummed it, it was uh, it was weird it was a weird it was a big under it was three to one under two to one in a lot of spots but uh pichota gonna have to be taking a step back and really looking at him and uh mersh hart has got a lot of heart we tend to like people with that had a big he had a leslie smith type of output once he got his tank going i thought he was throwing those rabid punches non-stop they weren't hurting him but it was by a thousand cuts about either guy going forward i kind of agree with that on to though we had steven Peterson defeating Matt Bissett, the favorite, in a dirty-ass split decision. I feel like we said it might be a dirty split. You were on Peterson's side for best-looking tattoo in the UFC. Not not best tattoo, but not worst by far. Uh, We saw definitely the volume. I have to be honest. I can't think of anything on this whole card really worth talking about except for the main event. Uh, the the real highlights that I should talk about. Uh, Peterson had a good gas tank in this. Is specifically this Gunther uh, Zuniga fight. Uh, the Tyler Diamond Mitchell fight went to decision, but the Gunther Zuniga bet hard against either one of those fighters, whoever they fight next. Either one of them. Zuniga has a bit of power. Cardio not that good. Horrible take down the fence. And Gunther ate every shot in the book and had. Some of the worst striking you're going to see in there. Definitely used his ground game, but couldn't even finish a low grappler like Zuniga. 
Uh, see, I don't think you can bag one single fighter that fought all weekend or any fight all weekend except the co-main event on Saturday night. Re well, I don't agree. I think that there was other spots. We're getting there real quick. The other one was Marquez DiCiricchio. That was a big upset. I feel like you were all over DiCiricchio. Because I'm just thinking Marcus uh, had tons of hype. I was all over Marcus. I thought I liked the Cuban Missile Crisis as well. I, he missed weight as well. By three, four weight. pounds. Four pounds. I, I put him on a lot. I don't remember if I think I had the Cuban I, Marquez, as, Marquez as well. Yeah. To win. And, you know, I was really bummed, though, because I really wish they weren't fighting each other yet. But D. Shirikio, I love him, love him going forward. I like everything he showed me. He looked, he looked really, really good in there as well. And the missile crisis did gasp, but it wasn't absolutely horrible. It was a no, mediocre showing. The rest I of the fights... I'm, I'm jumping off that hype train. Yeah. Off of those... I totally agree with that 100%. The co-main event... I might have just bought a ticket. Like, it was a station, and I jumped off the Marquez hype train and jumped off oh. the d -Shirikio. So, the Cuban missile crisis imploded into itself. Yeah. I like though, going forward a lot. He a was lot, definitely lot. exploited there. Though the co-main event in this one was very uneventful for the Friday Night Fights as well. It was uh, Trezano versus Gennetti. A lot of people throwing tons of hate towards Gennetti. Three to one favorite. Really had everything to win. But this is where I said he's... Somebody put it best. He is the love child of Rose Namajunas and Nate Diaz who didn't grow up without a father. Who grew up without a father. Who's the little... That's Trezino. Or that's Gennetti. Is that the guy? Who's the guy though with the glasses? The um, he fights out of John Cavanaugh's camp. That was Cuccinello? No, 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 no. Katona, Katona, the the champion from Canada who ended yeah. up winning the show. I liked him I the liked best his, too. He I did look good. Going forward. He was one of he those was favorites. My, one of my takeaways from the night. What about the violent Bob Ross? He he exploited a sucker. I felt like he was a little overrated. I do remember that. I do remember you being like... Oh, like, Vi Violent Bob Ross is a little overrated, but I also think something happened to him. Like, he might have broke something early. His foot, he broke it in the season. I, until I find... No, like, in the fight, it's fight well. itself. Good point. Something early, and if I find out that he did break something early, I'll save my judgment of that fight. But otherwise, I'm not really on that. But I do like the kid out of John Cavanaugh's camp and the main event. So, the main event, and I would say I am on that Pena train real quick. I think that that dude's definitely a top 10 easy, easy, easy. So, we'll see what happens as those fights go on. The main event, though, Adesanya piecing apart Brad Tavares for five rounds. Some refs gave it one round to Tavares. I don't think so. I think it was a one-sided game. I had one round Tavares. Because of that takedown? Uh, no, there I feel like the down. first round... Was it the first round? I thought it was like the first or second people were given first to First or artists. second. I really can't remember now. I, my takeaway from that fight had nothing to do, to do with Brad Tavares. So Adesanya, is he a real contender? Beating a number eight, coming in unranked, and PC, I mean, I love Tavares. We were both on the underdog there. I was a style bender hater, and I really was impressed with everything he showed me. And I don't everything. think Brad Tavares is a walkthrough at all. You know we were hyped on Brad Tavares. Yep. So to just walk through everything that I thought was dangerous, and there was a moment that I was nervous. I felt like, okay, Brad Tavares has this. But uh, I, it was round one. I thought Brad Tavares had round one, and mm -hmm. this is what impressed me so much about the style bender. He went into his corner, listened to his coaches, made the adjustments that needed to happen, came out and did exactly what they said to do, and controlled it the rest of the time. I loved everything I see from him, and everyone's setting him up to fight. Um, mm -hmm, he's somebody that won actually Saturday night, and I saw the online Twitter verse going crazy like, these two fighters need to fight. As we go through the fights, I'll remember it and I'll bring it back up. But I really, I was a hater, and now I like everything I saw, and I'm excited to watch the style bender going S forward. Style bender, definitely creating all sorts of havoc for the 185 pound division it's gonna be fun in yeah. there there's a bunch of it, it sneakily has become marquee division we were hating on it i remember at the beginning of this podcast at the time when it was just weidman and gastelum had just moved there and we were like it's stale musasi was still in the division so there's been a lot of movement a lot of people moving around 
Am I Wasn't right? it Sousa, Yoel yeah. Romero, Whitaker? But they were all locked. They were all deadlocked in their own positions. Bisping, Luke Rockhold. It was uh, Robert Whitaker, like, trudging through, breaking the ice. Breaking <laughs> the ice. <laughs> so Adesanya, definitely going to be a Whitaker fight. Think of that later on. Woo! Going to be a good one. On to the Saturday night fights, though. We ended up having a pay-per-view co-main event, as we already briefly went over. Falling through, Daniel Cormier almost falling out, getting a big spot. Actually, swollen leg, Dana White came out and said the very next day. But what Dana also uh, said after the fact... Uh, when he fell on stage during the press conference. Correct, correct. If you didn't see it, um, you can probably look it up. We won't put a link below because we're really just putting a camera in our audio podcast. <laughs> so look it up somewhere. It's not hard in the Google bar. Uh but uh, Daniel Cormier just stood up at the end of the presser and turned around, yep. and I was wondering if it's that same cable that got Tony Ferguson. That's what I think, exactly. And if you watch all of the backstage footage that's already come out, Dana White went and talked to him, and he was definitely, sh Daniel Cormier was shooken up, and they were both like, why are those things so close to the back of the stage? They're right behind the guy's chairs. It doesn't make any sense. So... All that hate that people were talking on uh, Tony Ferguson. People need to back off all of a sudden if uh, somebody, if you saw somebody else. It means that UFC don't give a damn about walking away. Well, no, the other thing, too, is don't be surprised if after this you don't find out that Daniel Cormier was injured going into the fight. Don't be surprised if you find that out at all because Daniel Cormier is the type of guy that'll be like, yeah, I had a torn MCL and I still fought. He because, actually did. Yeah. Have, he threw out his back two weeks before this fight. Dana Cormier did, and Dana knew about it, and they were going to play it day to day. But that's also why there was an alternate way in. Volkanovsky, or Volk, Volk, one of the big old giant Russian Volkies, ended up stepping in and also being weighed in at the 255 pound level in case one of these fighters would have fallen out. I like that insurance. I just hope they're getting taken care of for Here's making that Here's what I weight. think. How about spend a little less time weighing in Santos and weighing in these extra guys to just pad it and spend a little more time, um, I don't know, investing in wireless microphones or getting the fucking cords out of the way so we don't have some of my favorite fighters sidelined because of an injury that could have been prevented. I don't know. Maybe spend a little time researching the elevators inside the hotels that you stay at before you friggin' get all your fighters in one hotel. Take a little Very better good care. Very Maybe good those are all things that could be project spearheaded. Just a little shout out. It's been proven happy employees definitely make the company go around better and better. But uh, other guys who ended up missing weight over the weekend, we had Michael Fatboy Chiesa coming in there and saying he will no longer fight at 155 pounds. And guess what? 170 doesn't look any good because he can't be fitted fathers to save his life. Two losses in a row. But I'm jumping the shark a little bit. We should start from the bottom to the top. That was just the other little pre-weigh-in stuff that we had. We started off Whitmire, huge underdog, 2-1, to one, beating Moyle. I had Moyle on a few DraftKings. Still ended up cashing, but Moyle hurt me a little bit. I didn't have her too much. Definitely tentative on both of those ladies. I did like Whitmire's uh, length. She looked like she started to get her, use her length that was at the end of her punches. But tweet. What was it? It was a prop bet that I had, and I posted uh, on Friday night. I posted a prop bet that cashed out for decision for Bryce. But I missed this prop bet with Moyle inside the distance. I thought her ground game being at alpha male was going to really play a bigger role in this. And Whitmire Dometer dominated her everywhere, standing and on the ground. Moyle couldn't do anything, so... Taking a big step back on Moyle. Huge step back. Whitmire, I like the range like I was saying before. She finally looked like she was more comfortable in there than before. She said it herself afterwards. Did you see her flip off any McLeish? I wasn't impressed with either woman. <laughs> Did you see that whole controversy? I know, I'm sure. Like, <laughs> like, oh, both those ladies could beat your ass. Well, I don't know. Could they um, have a better podcast? Ooh. Because I'm not trying to stand in the octagon. Ooh. We'll see. We'll see. Well, we know Whitmire will get right up in really your face. I yeah, I agree. Was 
came out with too much. I just know who's ahead for the division. Um, there are they. 115 or 125 or something. I believe it was a 125 pound it's a, match. It's, 115, 115, sorry. About yeah, that. you either go against Rose, you have Rose up there. Yeah, the they're JJ, not. The, I just respect so much the top five of the women's 125 and 115 that even the top 10 of those divisions, those are both getting to be thick. To, eh, I, the women's 125. To. The top five of the women's 125, I should be a little. I just the bullet sitting up there and now Antonia. Like, do you even want to mess? It's with getting it? thick. It's getting thick. Uh, I think Whitmire is on the way up. We'll see. I don't like either of them. I'm not gonna bet them heavy. Though, on to the counterpart for let the Friday night's main event. We had John Hooker been training. Ugh, Dan the Hangman Hooker been training with Israel Adesanya for a while, and he showed us. A lot of that New Zealand striking is really coming through. Hangman Hooker getting three TKOs in a row. Durinho came out. As we were saying here, these Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys falling up with their striking. I'm not going to say that Burns looked bad striking because he didn't. He was actually picking apart Daniel Hooker's leg really well, landing good body shots. But Hooker adjusted well within the first round and ended up landing a couple of them knees and finally finishing that fight after getting hurt early at the end of the first I loved everything I saw about Hooker. Like I said, Dudinho will beat a lot of other guys with that exact same game plan, except that you need to, he needs to act that way in other fights where he necessarily hasn't. Dudinho looked good. Hooker looked better. I liked that fight. It was a flash in the pan. Got my blood boiling. Do you remember much of it? It was a quick one. Uh, Gilbert Burns is... I am not impressed with him so much <laughs> going forward i love everything i'm seeing from daniel hooker i was high on him before the fight even mm -hmm. higher after the fight uh i think it's time for him to be on a main card i think he can be on a main card and i'm even kind of interested in maybe dan hooker in a five-round fight maybe it's on a fox maybe an espn i don't know when that but i think he's of the echelon guys that starts getting tested uh to see where he's going next I totally agree. I like Daniel Hooker. On to another favorite who ended up finishing out the night. Curtis Melender, the courteous one, ended up defeating Max Payne Griffin. This was a bit scary. I had Melender on this. Were you on Griffin? Yep. And Griffin, at the end of that first round, took the fight down in the first round and ended up riding it out for the whole first round. Curtis Merlender adjusted and fought off every other takedown and just won a striking battle for the next two rounds. 29-28 ended up going for Merlender. I think they both showed well. It was a way more grinding of a fight than people thought it was. Melender's hype train definitely slowed down. He was a huge 3-1 favorite. Rightfully so. Max Payne looked all sorts of good. Um, I don't think I take much away from either guys. These were both way higher caliber. This is going to be... These guys, I feel like, is the Max Holloway, Conor McGregor fight that nobody knew was happening. And then two years later, it was like, whoa, those guys were. I think both these guys are top five guys. They just are growing. They're both 26, 27 years old, growing right into the division. What did you think went on in this one? I don't know what happened to Max Griffin. Uh, his cardio was kaputs after the first round and for all intents and purposes wrestling is his gig so taking somebody down in round one and should be his bread and butter that should be where he exerts the least amount of energy because that's what he does yep. so I wasn't impressed that he comes in in the second round and doesn't do anything or was Melender that good that's that what he I think just changed happened. his game plan and really stepped up that's what I think I've been I was high on Max Griffin, so I guess I have to look out for Melinda going forward. He made all the right changes to his game plan to really be successful. And the longer the fight went on, the more his computer downloaded and yep. the more he controlled Max Griffin. Yep. That good fight IQ is also something that you do want to be watching for all these young guys. They can make those adjustments early on into their careers in the UFC money moves to be made against them but I feel a lot of people two, two, six. Woo! still, I'm just still a little... burnt she mm. got burnt I got poked <laughs> in the eye by 226 Glenn Close Glenn motherfucking <laughs> every time <laughs> Glenn Close 
Dracar Close. 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> Dracar Close ended up coming in big as an underdog. I know Lesbo was all over this close-ass dirty split. We called it being a split. Venata ended up not pulling the trigger, getting outstruck, out-wrestled, and edged out by all senses of the words. Venata, really, really iffy with Venata. He's won some good fights, lost some that are dirty-ass splits. Close makes it close every single time we say here on the show and uh i think i'm gonna stay exactly where i am with both of these guys close is super de- yeah he looked better than he ever has in there but he still didn't blow out venata and uh not that it, it's it's hard it's hard in there these I both think are venata still better. beats guys yeah close just beats more guys and close venata is gonna slowly be on the way down in progression uh like right now he's in kind of the sweet spot uh, and uh, close is crawling, and I think one of the better guys in the division. He's a little yep. untapped, unsung hero that everyone's gonna forget about for the next two or three fights that you're gonna be able to sneak in. He was my, one of my little underdogs that saved my whole night. I really loved Lovely. everything that he showed me. He looked like a little Kevin Lee. He was fast, used his ground game intelligently, made all the changes that he needed to. His hands were quicker. He looked better than Venata everywhere. I agree. Totally agree. Rafael Asuncao coming in as a big favorite, dominating Rob Font. I was all over that Font train. Thought he was, thought we were going to see Asuncao finally start to look a little bit old, and he did not. Asuncao went back to all of his crafty old veteran moves, hurt Font a couple times. I love Font's movement, loved his angles, loved everything about it. He just could not better the Asuncao train there, but Asuncao is. Definitely a top five guy, top three guy, easy in that division. Only lost to TJ Dillashaw. I'm going to still, I see Font beats a lot of other guys. I don't think it's that bad of a loss for him at all. The Sun's house stays where he's at. Nothing really changes in that I position gonna for me. I was going to ask you, what do you think about Font? Do you think maybe, like, it's not now, but maybe two years from now he find, he beats a Sun's out and passes him? I believe if or that... Or do you think uh, how long is his ship going to sail? For me in a Sun's out, I'm just waiting for him to get old overnight. And Font, I still feel like, has a year or two to fully finish out. Because he looks better and better every time I see him in there. Font's losses are to Lineker and a Sunsau. Like, that ain't bad. And pa- Pedro Munoz. Those I, aren't bad losses. In my opinion, and this is going to get haters, I think a Sunsau beats Cody Garbrandt pretty easily. I would love to see that fight. I, I don't think Cody should have gotten the rematch at all. We're, uh, we've all, we, we talked about that oh, on the show. We've talked about it's that. It's such a push. It's yeah. such a push. Especially that the UFC. TJ had two years that he had to fight contenders to I'm get just, back there. Oh. I'm so I'm really excited to see TJ in the octagon. Anytime I can watch TJ Dillashaw fight, I'm excited about it. And I'm not a Cody Garbrandt hater. I really like him. I just don't think it's great for him to have this rematch right now. Anyways, that's an off topic. But talking about a sunsail now, what does yep. a sunsail do from here? Just sit around and wait, wait for this, this fight to be that's over. That's exactly it. Exactly. Exactly it. So, Asun Sao, he's definitely the hype pre- the prospect killer. Get him any other prospect coming up in there, and he will shut them down. Then we went on to one of the highlights of the entire night. We had Paulo Bohachina against the Uriah Hall himself. This went into the first, second round. Ended up going into the second round. Hall looked good, really on the back foot, throwing jabs in there. Both of these guys throwing great, great jabs. Hall throwing a flicking straight jab, bloodied up Costa, the most blood I've seen on Costa in many of his fights. Uh, But Costa got trudging through. Actually, the body attack for Costa is where, and is cutting the cage, is really where this guy makes his money. And it's a great, great style to have with heavy hands, and he has heavy hands. Love the head movement on both of these fighters. Um... It was just Hall that couldn't take it. Hall starting to look a little bit older in there. Hard starting to look a little. Who's the lady we were talking about? He's ready for the Thunderdome. Right? Tina Turner? Tina, no, no, no. Who was uh, with the haircut that Uriah Hall had? He looked like the Mad Max Conan lady. 
We looked. We saw her name. Twelve years a slave. No. <laughs> no, not at all. That's horrible. But his haircut was all sorts of messed up for Hall. Ended up getting busted around <laughs> by Costa for sure. Django Unchained. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that at times. There was definitely that. Did not look good on the top. Yeah, it was just a little. The sides were cleaned up. He just needed to fix. Need to fix up it the top. It was a business on the sides, party on the top. For sure. <laughs> With Hall, I think he still beats other people in there. Costa is definitely fast tracked. Gonna the the scary thing with Costa is if that hype gets to him because everybody's talking about his looks and his power, and it's the easy trap of it's easy. I don't have to train that hard. I'll just get in there. I think Uriah Hall looked better than he yeah. has the whole time I've been watching UFC. Yeah, he really did. Really did. So good. He took tons of power shots. Yeah. I thought. Uppercuts for days until they finally finished it, but Costa landed that uppercut multiple times over. Body shots multiple times over. Do you think Costa has good enough to keep going forward, or do you think he's going to have to learn a little better head movement? I think he is going to have to learn not better head movement. It's going to probably be that takedown defense eventually he's going to get there. The gas tank was what everybody was waiting on for Costa. He made it into the second round, and... Didn't look like he slowed down too much at all. He looked like he was throwing just as hard of body shots, just as hard of power shots all the way until that finish came. Oh, Uriah. Poor guy, but he can finish many, many, many other guys in there. Did we see him in Orlando? No. No. No, 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 we did not. He seems like one of those guys on a Fox card, Uriah Hall. Yeah, I'll be excited to watch him on a Fox card for a few times to come. Few fights, few more. Totally. He's getting a little up there. But Costa, oh, that's who it is. For Adesanya Costa. Oh, that's damn. That's the fight everyone wants. That is a great, great fight, but let them get another couple highlights and then two fights apiece and then them. Or one fight more apiece, give them one more highlight and then get them in there against each other. But they need to be in the top ten if they're fighting each other. They can't be outside of it. That's That's not right. I think they are each other's next task. It would be a fun one. I'm just because Ada yeah. Hasanya beat Brad Tavares, who I think is one of the top ten yes. guys. Eight number and, eight. And uh, Costa beat Uriah Hall, who's got to be probably one of the top ten guys right now. Hall's been coming off of a three fight losing streak. Then he won one against an unranked guy. I so know the division's just yeah. not that deep. True, true, true. But we were just saying earlier, eighty five sneakily gotten a bunch of heavy hitters There's in there. Like, Chris Weidman is, no joke, probably the number one contender. Well, Gastelum and Whitaker are officially the coaches. So that means that they fight after that season. So Kevin Gastelum is the number one contender after he lost to Weidman, which doesn't make any sense. But But that's what's happening. Weidman lost three times in a row before then. I'm just saying, those are the guys in the top five. I know. So I think Uriah Hall is probably number nine. He's bouncing around those spots for sure. Anyway, Costa going on. Costa. Then we got to the pay per view, and we had one of our biggest underdogs come through. We were definitely hesitant on whether we were going to pick Khalil Roundtree over Sasaki or Gokan Saki or Mike Perry. We ended up winning them both, and Gokan Saki. Definitely a great kickboxer, a little bit older for that. I loved what yeah, I we saw. Yeah, we were like the only people in America that didn't it, have Gokhan Saki. Super, super. He, I cashed on DraftKings. Khalil Roundtree. We should have had Khalil as our Leslie Smith underdog. You even it was said one it. Side. Yep. You said Khalil. You know, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm hesitant. I'm like, I feel like he's going to get it done pretty easy. The biggest hesitant thing I have about this fight is that Khalil knocked out this amazing striker, so... Just like before, people are going to say, you can't stand with Khalil. He's going to knock you out. But we've seen it happen two or three times in a row now where if you take Khalil down and grind him out, he is finishable. He does have weaknesses. Do not put too much hype into this. Sasaki isn't as good as people thought. He beat Henrique barely by the skin of his teeth after he got hurt. I was just like, Roundtree doesn't have to land half as many of those shots. He just lands with more power. And it came to fruition. Uh, what do you take away from this I massacre? Meh. 
Yeah, exactly. I didn't have enough faith to make it the Leslie Smith underdog pick. So that's how I feel about it. So we had a fatty boo baddy coming in against Sorry, former champ. Sorry, so hard to please. <laughs> we... Pettis coming in over the 155 or 57 pound Kiesa. Kiesa definitely moving up, but how can you move up? How can you say, I'm out of here, I'm never fighting at 155 again, and then you lose to a guy who waited at 154? It was a ground game, a clinic. Kiesa should have been able to beat him on the ground, but we've now seen Lee and Anthony Pettis just exploit Michael Kiesa. Pettis doing it off of his back, setting up a triangle to an arm bar that was just why Pettis has been able to submit so many people that have not why been submitted. Why is everyone so high on Kiesa? Because he's beat a couple guys or had grinding fights where he can beat guys that are willing to brawl with him. But if you're a tactician, which people are figuring can out. Can you think of any guys that he's beat off the top of your head? Nope. <laughs> no one worth mentioning I that know, I can I think was of. So, and right after weigh-ins, I thought Pettis looked so much better. He looked really good after weigh-ins. And Kiesa, I don't know if, I don't know where he goes from here. His I don't know where he goes from here. Striking is so bad that at 170, guys with a little bit better striking and more power, because that was Kiesa's, I feel like, one of his biggest games was he's so big he'll jump over the top of you get you to the ground and submit you but Pettis showed if he can't grab me he can't take me down and I can pick him apart all day late kicks played heavy for Pettis and on the ground Mike Kiesa can also be exploited so gonna really take a step backwards on him and then he Pettis is still super tentative with it's like did he beat a guy as you were saying that maybe wasn't as good as we all thought he was yeah I don't know where I go with Kiesa going forward, and I think Anthony Pettis is going to be a guy that they're going to be feeding to the monsters for here on out. When they think they have a young kid coming through that's ready to pay their way, but he's still he's got wins left in him. I'm still I like everything I saw him do. Totally, he looks like he's grown since his last two fights. Meh, but Kiesa, meh. Probably got glass in his eye. Probably got a little bit of a little ref leftover glass in there. I'm glass sure. I'm in sure. His eye from that At 170, we'll see. Got we'll the see. In his eye. Mike Perry coming in as a huge, un huge underdog to a 155er. I gotta say, after weigh-ins, I was really hesitant about our podcast because I was like, Perry's so much bigger than him. Perry hit so much harder. I was so when I saw weigh-ins, I was like, Oh, Felder is way bigger than Michael Perry. And I am super hesitant on the power. No one's really been able to finish Felder. And this was a bloody, bloody war. But I believe Michael Perry was cutting in his body from his normal weight to get to that weight. And I think that was Felder's uh, natural walking around. Like he might have cut like five pounds. But I know for a fact Paul Felder is usually shredded. And not that he wasn't still shredded. Right. But he definitely had a little water weight that we normally don't see him have. Even though he was bigger. You are right. In totally. every way. He was taller, bigger everywhere. Across the shoulders, chest, Everything. arms. Yeah, you're Everything. right. Everything. You're right. So... What we were then talking about outside of the podcast was, hey, Perry has been at a better camp. He says he has turned it around, and it showed in there. Much more disciplined, put a game balance together, was able to listen to combinations, and there was a couple of headbutts that ended up uh, affecting Didn't the bloodiness Paul of this. break his arm? In the first round. We so, had a tough rough as nails. Uh, part with this. The stream wasn't as clean as you guys get here on the other side at Lab B. We don't want to throw so, our cable company under the bus since they're going to fix it. Either <laughs> way, this one ended up going to decision here at Lab B. This was our underdog pick of the week. Yeah. Coming through. Platinum. Making money again. Roundtree being another big underdog. I was just as proud of Platinum Mike Perry as he was of himself for his first decision victory. And I do think it's a testament that... He has grown enough to know he needed to change his camps and keep growing. Like, he was being stunted. He was this diamond in the rough, no pun intended, <laughs> that came out of this little small camp and kind of needed to... 
I think he has what it takes to continue to go forward. He's only 26 years old. Yep. I like Mike Perry. I liked it. I loved the water at all. And Paul Felder is no walkthrough. Yep. Um, we'll see what's going on with his arm and everything. Totally, totally. Um, what I love about Paul Felder is, again, he can just keep doing commentating. And he has so many avenues. How do you feel about Kiesa Felder 170? Yeah, maybe. I like it. I, I don't, know. I don't I know if Paul Felder deserves to lose his spot at 155. He was stepping up in a week's notice. Good point. Good, yeah. good point. But Mike, that or, was a fun one. Kiesa does deserve to lose his spot. And Kiesa and Cowboy it should be the next fight. And they should kind of open up the 160. I don't think so. I think Cowboy, Cowboy needs to be guy fighting guys that have bigger names than Kiesa. Because Kiesa only wins in that regardless due to the name value yeah so Maybe. i don't know who's a bigger name for cowboy there's a few out there we got some we got many if they're bigger fights, names than cowboy they have no interest in fighting cowboy true 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 there's Cowboy's a lot a of upper he's kind of like a pettis he's going to be fighting you know he's going to be that's going to be his job in the ufc but I do believe he gets to open the 165 division. I do think it should oh, be Cowboy. Oh, that would be so dope. Don't you think it should be Cowboy that gets to do that? And it doesn't matter who. i just ready. It's ready. I'm ready for it. What I'm not ready for is the co-main event ended up stepping in. Derek Lewis versus Francis Naganu, no, notoriously going to be known as one of the worst fights in MMA history, no joke. This is not me. One. This is the worst fight. There's some bad ones in there, and I think John Attic said it best. If you go back and listen, he's like, I can think of one other heavyweight one that was bad. And what one was it? I couldn't tell you because it was like UFC six and five. Ever. This was definitely make you want to poke your own eyes out. Francis Ngannou, a lot of people bringing a lot of heat towards his way because. The most tentative you're going to see somebody in the ring was Francis Ngannou. A lot of people say that Stipe Miocic changed Francis Ngannou for the worst. It's one of those times when you first take a loss and you're like, wow, I am human. Wow, I do believe. I don't think he was undefeated, though. I do believe he has a loss in there before, but he never got pummeled for five rounds. I believe his other loss was like maybe he was held down. Stipe did punch him for five rounds straight. But every, that, this is what everybody's been saying. I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think Francis Ngannou shot Joe Rogan and everybody else was piling on Dana White as well, saying he needs a sports psychologist, he needs everything. Look at everybody who's fought Derek Lewis. Everybody. He puts them a punch or two <coughs> under their regular punch ratio because everybody who fights Derek Lewis understands that he's a heavy puncher. And you just can't come in by the seat of your pants. He'll sit you down. Everybody who's fought Derek Lewis has had a lower output. But what was the biggest thing that happened? Why do you think it turned into such a bad... Derek Lewis was throwing punches and kicks. Herb Dean almost took a point. Which, if there was ever a time to take a point for tentativeness... Fuck Herb Dean. It would have been here, right? He should have taken the point already. He right? waited until, what, 15 seconds before the first round was over to tell them that they were Maybe inactive. Second. No, first round. First, okay. And he did it like 15. And then the second round, he waited until like a full two and a half minutes was almost all the way friggin' gone. And like, then clapped his hands. He just let too much time friggin' go the whole time. And it, the whole fight was annoying to me. Yeah, you might get knocked out, but the same to be said, you might knock out somebody else. Dancing around for these decisions isn't really like... That was bullshit. That was bullshit. And it Joe was, Rogan has so much shit to say about... Uh, he lays there and talks crap about CM Punk. He has no problem with talking shit, but he didn't say shit about that boring fight. I do like the post-fight presser that Derek Lewis is like taking no credit... Yep. And won't even let it go down. Um, you can see that the UFC kind of just wants to cut and run from Francis. Yes. You yes. can see the way Dana set it up that he's just like his ego's so big. He has he didn't train at all for before Stipe. He just doesn't even care. Blah blah blah. F him. They're just gonna fold that under the rug and you won't remember 
that is the fight. They'll try to bury that and build up Derek Lewis because he's funny. Yes. And let him get the back surgery he needs and maybe a year off and then let him come back. That would be the best thing to happen to Derek Lewis. I don't know about Nganu. Did he get lucky with Overeem? And it's just like... It was a different game plan. He exchanged. He had a different... I don't want to say aura, but posture. He had a different game plan, and it was definitely push forward. But that's the name of the. That's why there's tentative rules, tentativeness rules. That's why you can get docked for not engaging. No, he they should have had points taken, both of them. I I don't think Derek Lewis, because Derek Lewis was throwing Everyone's strikes. Being biased for Derek Lewis, he was like four strikes. He was like he was throwing. He was Elias Thurdoin, where he was throwing in the air. <laughs> and Nagami was just literally backing up and letting him kick. But uh, the output, this I, is more, our I'm breakdown gonna, is more exciting than I'm the fight. I'm going to agree with the Beast. He didn't do shit in that fight. Did I'm you gonna see agree with him about himself. The fans booing. Neither did Nganu. I don't think either guy deserves all the weight. They were horrible dance partners. They were both yep. scared. Maybe they both respected each other too much. That would be the compliment I'd give it. But I was just really friggin' disappointing. And it stepped up. They were like, Derek Lewis said we should have been the co-main event anyway after Mac Holloway, Brian Ortega fell out, which I'm like, okay. You better show, baby. Come on, banger. Yep. Better make it Good one. Good thing you have consummate professionals that are coming up next that are gonna have a banger. I don't know what else. Yeah, you're right. Our breakdown that we just we just got into more of a fight. <laughs> exactly. About Derek Lewis. <laughs> so, hopefully, they give Nagano somebody that's that he can't just walk through. Hopefully, they still give him a test to be like, all right, man, push comes to shove. You want to be a UFC fighter? Let's fight, baby. Though the heavyweights that did come to the main event, Daniel Cormier, constant professional, was hurt two weeks before, threw out his back. Ended up fighting Miocic on after the finale show. Everything in there. They were both professionals the whole time, having a good time. And it, this ended up being, what, two minutes? Three minutes into the first round? We had Daniel Cormier coming off of the clinch, breaking the clinch and throwing a piston of a right inside, dropping Miocic and then landing two following shots where Miocic actually pushed the ref and was really angry afterwards. But he was out. There's no way he wasn't. Lesbo, I think, initially was saying he wasn't out. How do you feel now after you've seen all of the replays? Was he out I think on he the was ground? Out. I think so too. He went limp legs. He had both his eyeballs poked before he was punched. But Great point. In those first two minutes, he looked like the, his face was cut with razors. For as short of a fight as it was, it looked like for as little as a fight it was. It was DC pulled out every single cheat in the book. So you're telling me a guy who has used a towel to make weight. A guy who has constantly bent the rules. It was almost bad, like the second. Did something weird. DC what do you tried to get a competitor, takedown. Competitor, lifelong competitor. Stipe turned it, stuffed it, yep. controlled it. Instantly, DC was like, "Oh shit, it's about to get different." He thumped his eye. He did flick it early. He literally <laughs> flicked his eye. That was know. nuts. That was nuts. I know. I'm not trying to be a DC hater. I and love I do. He did everything right, but something was weird in that fight. Nor do I think Stipe would ever say, well, he poked me in both my eyes. That's why I lost, because Stipe is a goddamn gentleman. But DC really is living John Jones' dream. I have to say this. And he can't be the greatest of all time if he lost twice to somebody. Ouch. It's such a f weird world we live in, just like the real world. Everything Not is great. Not because you can't be the greatest of all time. I don't. And maybe I'm naive. Can you be undefeated? And be the greatest? Yes. That's what I think yeah. the greatest means. No. I don't think I think you can, you can have a defeat and still be the greatest of all time. I think that can happen because you can have it early in your career when you were your first pro fight and then win 30 in a row every championship five times in a row i think you would be a what about there. two losses yes it depends on how many fights you have in your career in general what about two losses against the same person ah! <laughs> <laughs> 
going to be loud. It's a good point. It's a really, really, really good point. How do you feel about Derek Lewis? Because it's like, I agree with everything yeah. you're saying. I do think, yes, you you almost need a loss to be the greatest of all time, in my yes. opinion. Uh, the diversity is important, and you don't want them all to be knockouts. Sometimes decision wins are important in there, and who you fight does matter. Yes, it does. And uh, I don't think you just sweep their legacy... You can't call Stipe, and I don't even know if I like the term GOAT, greatest of all time. I almost think it doesn't exist. It's pound for pound. It's the same as a pound for pound. There's no such thing there's as greatest. There's no such thing there's as no pound su- for pound. Ex- there's, there's no such thing as greatest of all time. Greats. Yes. There's just the greats. Yes. There's just some, will DC always be remembered as one of the greats? Yes. 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 He may be on Rushmore. I could easily see that. I like that. If I we could were to plan one day when Lat B has real money, mural behind us, maybe DC's face is on our Rushmore. That's what he would get out of it. <laughs> I like that. I like that. How do you feel about DC versus Derek Lewis? Lewis coming off of the number one contender fight. But I what guess, are you talking about? <laughs> I guess Brock Lesnar came in and about? stepped in and took over for that next fight. Actually, Evil Twin, real quick, the best thing that came out of that Nagano Lewis fight, Evil Twin owes me $10 and now has officially renounced MMA due to that fight. And the Cormier Brock Lesnar situation, where if you ever thought WWE had a part in our world or tried to deny it, you can't anymore. Because that was the most, what is it, show, what do they call it, work that I've ever seen. It's a work. Brock Lesnar comes in the ring after DC calls him in there. And then pushes him. And DC literally jumps back like he would in any old wrestling show. Which DC is an avid WWE fan. It doesn't hide any bones about it. Wants to be a pro wrestler as well. Or wanted to in his life. And now he's getting a shot. We know what's coming down the pipeline. It's Lesnar. It's Jones at heavyweight. Lewis doesn't have a chance. Lesnar looked lean in there. He looked good. I hate to say it body-wise. I can't fucking take this shit seriously, <laughs> what he did. But I will. this is what I think happened. This is my breakdown. He got a call however long ago that the fans have been churning and burning this John Jones idea and everything going on. You know he's a company man. He's good with the UFC and WWE, and they have handshakes with Passover between certain fighters and everything like that. And it's obviously you're not breaking your contract for UFC to go and act. I mean... Uh, wrestle over in WWE so it doesn't hurt anything so he gets a call he's like show up here we're shutting up this whole thing because they think they know friggin heavyweight at Bellator we're about to slay this thing down so Brock shows up in the room he has him set up he's an actor they tell him this is what we want you to do this is what I think personally I think Brock Lesnar was there because and think of how much more sense this makes to walk in after Derek and fucking Naganu put on a slayer. They put on this slaying fight right. that we all thought we were going to see. Right, we all were hoping for. It's either Derek or Francis standing there. Either guy standing there talking to Joe. Brock Lesnar walks in the cage. Blah, blah, blah. Pushes him. All the guards are in there to break it up. Think of how much more build up. And I know everyone's like, Oh, but do you see it? No. Think of it. Okay, so you're building up the story. So that all happens. This is all there. All the pictures of it. All the work of it yep. being there. And you know either yep. Francis or Nagano is immediately going to jump back. They're not going to laugh at it and be like, hey, Brock Lesnar. They're going to be heated and into it. And they know they could have egged it on. It would have been perfect. Now, I bet you this. Stipe, fucking DC, have their moment, everything. Was John Jones in the fucking rafters ready to sting down? Fucking after they won. Is he still somewhere? He was quiet. I haven't seen John Jones. That's all I waited to see. What does John Jones have to say about all this? Where's John Jones at right now? I think he was just as maybe somewhere involved, ready to play a different role. Like, was he going to walk out? Everyone's like, no, this is UFC. You, there, there wasn't, wasn't going to be flames and he was going to walk out. 
Really though? Look at what the new era of TV that we've Soon rolled enough. into. Soon enough. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I'm, you know, I'm trying not to be a Brock hater. It's going to be, it's a rough one. It's a weird one for me. It is definitely a new era of promotion that is taking full effect. All of the deals coming on. We have tons of content on the way. Fight cards coming up weeks on after. This coming up weekend, we're going to have another breakdown coming up later in the week. Firing on all cylinders. Let us know what you think out there, wherever you're getting all, us, whether it be podcast or on the YouTubes. Yeah, feel free to hit us up on the YouTubes, on the Instagrams. We're pretty shitty at the Facebook. We'll try to get better. We're pretty, we're not great at, uh, anywhere, but we try to be great right here. So, I guess we'll see you Wednesday, and thanks for listening. We love you. Let's go to Thanks for listening to Let Be. For all things Lesbo and the Bean, head over to lesboandthebean.com or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.